Perfect. Okay. I think we're all ready to start on time, which would be super. And then we'll try and finish on time because um, we have the closing remarks for the day right after us. I don't know if anyone else is looking forward to seeing those drawings from the sessions, but uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how the cartoonist came up with capturing different things today. Uh, so if you are joining our session now, we are continuing on with the topic of mental health and psychosocial support, standard 10 uh, in the minimum standards. Um, it's, uh, my name is Joanna Wedge. I work for the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group of the Global Alliance as the UNICEF co-lead. And it's my great pleasure to be here as a facilitator for this 40 minute session. It's looking at innovations, responding to child protection concerns during COVID-19 with um, two, not one, some people got the invitation with just one, but actually two wonderful presenters from the MHPSS Collaborative. Uh, the flow of the, uh, of the session is not just presentation, but also some polling and exercise with you, because we certainly want your engagement and we want to know what have you been facing over the past six or seven months uh, in the various contexts that you've worked in when it comes to MHPSS. So we're going to look at um, many of the resources that were developed by the collaborative or, or through the collaborative, um, as well as adapting your programming and, and what that was like. At any time, we're really happy to receive your questions. Um, we can either weave them in straight away or, or have a time a bit later where we can respond to them. Um, so please, in the chat box, feel free to put down any of the questions you have uh, that the speakers are, are referring to or another pressing concern that you have relating to the topic of MHPSS in COVID-19, uh, especially around resources and gaps and, and so on. So I would uh, turn my time now over to our two presenters. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Leslie Snyder and Dr. Carmen uh, Vaya. Um, they, between them, they have many years of work on MHPSS in emergencies, including disasters, conflicts, and uh, outbreaks, including the Ebola virus. They worked together uh, at first adapting the psychological first aid, the PFA, for the Ebola crisis, and now work together at the MHPSS Collaborative, along with their colleague Ashley Namiro, who was in the video, but who has since gone off on maternity leave. Um, the team has developed many resources, conducted webinars uh, for staff care, and supported global MHPSS advocacy during the COVID-19. So welcome and a huge thanks to both of you for preparing this, well, working with Ashley to prepare the video and now also on, these, uh, on this time with us today. If I could turn over first to Leslie and ask you to explain a little bit about the MHPSS Collaborative. Sure, I'm happy to. Thank you so much, Joanna. And it's really great to, to be here with you all. It's exciting for us. Um, so the, the Collaborative, the MHPSS Collaborative we are a global platform for research, innovation, knowledge sharing, and advocacy in the field of MHPSS um, for children, youth, and families in adversity. We are hosted by Save the Children in Denmark, and so we do have uh, some colleagues <laughs> on the line um, that, uh, that we work quite closely with as well. And um, we, but we are actually a globally facing entity. So we work um, always through other actors. And uh, when COVID happened, of course we did that. And we did a lot of work through um, developing resources with the child protection area of responsibility, with the IASC, MHPSS reference group, and also with Save the Children. Um, so that was really around the resource development. We, we did, uh, also, we had ongoing programs in the background as well. So we were also working on adapting our ongoing programs with people with whom we have other um, partnerships. But that's what the collaborative is. And a busy collaborative uh, <laughs> on a regular day. And COVID, I'm sure, added an extra layer to all of that. Um, Carmen, if I could turn to you and ask you, you know, when COVID uh, became such a pressing issue, did your work within the collaborative, your ways of working change? Yeah, and absolutely. And, and I guess uh, a big part of that change is the same that many of the colleagues in the call have, say, have faced uh, on, on our own way, on a daily way of working, on not being able to be together. We are a very 
we're a very cozy group. We always work uh, pretty much in the same office. And so that change in itself, like everybody else, um, has had an impact on learning to how to do it in, in a distant way, how to work from in a remote way, as Leslie was mentioning, how to continue providing uh, all of the projects that we were doing, but without being able of being in uh, in place, having to learn all of these technologies. Um, so definitely it's been a big change in that regard, I would say like everybody else uh, in every sector. But definitely we very quickly also experienced um, a very large uh, demand on MHPSS materials. Um, I think every MHPSS actor has uh, noticed from the beginning that probably because this crisis, unlike many other crises, it touches all of us. And we all experience the isolation, the having to be at home, the, the stress with having my children and my husband and my work to do from my living room. So suddenly everybody was living in their own skin, uh, the challenges in terms of mental health and well-being. And that meant that we had a massive increase on demands, uh, not the collaborative, the whole sector started to be requested all sorts of supports from from the field from communities and um yeah it's been a definitely a, an increase on on work and obviously trying to balance that with making sorry carmen that was my fault i muted someone else but I... <laughs> it's fine i saw you've been muted i was like okay <laughs> I, I will unmute myself and keep on talking. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, but definitely it's been it's been a challenge to make sure that everything that we had ongoing before COVID, which was already a uh, big uh, continued, plus this new layer of, of work. And I would say that uh, probably something, uh, my final point, uh, something that everybody has experienced here, especially humanitarian actors, this was, um, this was a different situation. We were responding to a humanitarian crisis and affected by a humanitarian crisis at the same time. And that for me has been a massive difference that took us a few months to realize we are not in the field. I'm not taking R&R &R in a few weeks. I, I need to also balance my life, not only um, will be enough others. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we were all national staff in our own countries, our own communities dealing with this in our own families and so on, absolutely. Um, so I actually want, I mean, you've talked about how much work there is and how many requests there were to the collaborative and so on. Um, I would actually like to turn that over to the participants. We have about uh, 45 people uh, joining the call. Um, and we have a Mentimeter for you to do. Uh, and there are two questions. Uh, and there's a scale here that you can slide the button along the scale to tell us uh, how important you found these two topics. So, can you rate the importance of MHPSS in the first months of your COVID response programming? So initially, how important was the MH MHPSS component in your programming? And then the second uh, question is, can you rate the importance of mental health and well-being for you personally and your family during this period? So the left-hand side is the lowest and the right-hand side is the highest. So if you your MHS, MHPSS programming was quite low initially, then um, please put it over on the left and you slide it over on the right. So for those of you, I think most people have by now used Mentimeter, but you click on the link, you put in the code, and then you'll see the particular questions. And as I say, you can slide that button over. So while you go ahead and do that, you probably have the answer in your mind and now you're getting the technology to catch up with the human brain. So while you're actually doing that task, um, I'm going to actually ask Leslie um, to present on the kinds of the themes and the types of requests you got at, at that collaborative level. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I think they, they were maybe a bit what you would expect in some ways and a few things that surprised us as well. Um, so a lot of the requests very early on, since we do work, uh, we have a child and family focus, was the support to the well-being of children who were out of school, um, including children uh, coping with uncertainty, missing their friends, having new worries, adapting to new types of learning remotely, um, so how can you help children of different ages who are now faced with that very different situation? And of course, very related to that was the support to the well-being of caregivers 
um, uh, because they were taking on these dual roles of working from home, taking over the um, education of children in some cases, um, and also caregivers in fragile settings who may have also lost livelihoods and then were coping with the additional stress of that, um, as well as now adapting to a very changed family life. Um, the other thing, and Carmen alluded to this, was the support to staff and their well being. So we re received a request to join in um, well being seminars and webinars for emergency education staff, MHPSS staff, um, as well as for others. Um, so, really, for humanitarian staff of all sectors and to be thinking about the well being of all humanitarian responders, given that we were living. Uh, the crisis that we were working in um, and also for ourselves. And so it was actually really lovely to participate in those because we learned a lot of techniques for our, ourselves in those webinars uh, too. Um, and really with the message that we had to be much more deliberate about that and innovative in how we um, addressed well-being for staff. The, some, one of the surprising things maybe was um, just a reach out from colleagues um, uh, in, in some of the country offices that they were faced with a lot of suicidal ideation for children who could not access child-friendly spaces that they had previously been going to. So that kind of isolation from their usual supports was actually leading to an increase in suicide. So this was more, it's more anecdotal evidence, not something we tracked, but um, it was interesting um, to note that and, and a bit alarming as well. Um, and that also leads to some of the other requests where were just these challenges to delivering usual programming, both child protection, psychosocial programming, as well as education programming and others. So there were many requests to assist with how can we adapt case management and other types of activities to the new reality. Super. Um, and I think we're going to show one of the resources now. Is that the plan? Yeah. And actually, let me lead into that a little bit. Um, so this was, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're a global platform. So the way that we felt we could best contribute um, was the development of resources that could be used and accessed at a global scale um, for all children and families, as well as for actors across sectors for child protection and education and others. So um, Carmen will describe those resources that we wanna highlight in a little bit and, and who we worked with on those. But this is just one that we wanted to um, show right at the outset uh, as an example of some of the early response uh, materials that we developed. And this one we developed with the child protection area of responsibility. And um, it's a short animation, but it accompanies a larger um, document. So what, what you're going to see here is, is, a, is a bit of the clip that is really about what you can do for your children. You can go ahead. So, how to take care of your mental health. There are many ways to stay well during this difficult time. Adequate rest and some time for yourself is very important but do not stay most of the time in bed. Stick to your normal sleep routine. Ensure you have some daily exercise, even when you cannot leave the house. The same goes for talking with friends or neighbors. They're probably in the same situation and would love to hear from you, even by phone or text message. We all want to stay informed but the news can have a big impact on your emotional well-being. So, focus on the news only at a specific moment once a day and keep in mind that there are a lot of rumors and fake news. And last but not least, if you follow all the guidelines regarding hygiene and contacts with others, you should be proud of yourself because you are doing everything you can to protect your family. Try to think of beautiful things when you get overwhelmed. Accept that you are human and feelings of anxiety, fear or anger are normal. Now, what can you do for the mental health of your children? Despite the changes around us, it is necessary to give children the structure they are used to 
as much as possible. Establish a routine for eating times, playing times and sleep times, and also for learning times, even when the children are out of school. Try as much as possible to address your children in the same way as you did before, even if they are babies. Also, children around the age of two often use the word no. Accept this as normal behavior. Children above three years old may start behaving younger than their age. Possibly, they start wetting their bed again. Remember that this is just temporary. Also, these children like to explore things and places. Don't limit this behavior as long as it is safe. Children might have nightmares or panic attacks about losing their parents or other people they love. Respond by saying that you understand these feelings. Ask them to share what they're thinking and allow them to express what they are afraid of. Reassure them that now we are doing everything we can to protect ourselves and we will always be there for them. Lovely. That, yeah. What a great clip to have chosen. Thanks. I wanted, to, I chose a certain age range, uh, but it goes on to talk about adolescence. So, right. Yeah. All right. That's what I need in my household. So I'll, <laughs> I'll be sure to watch the rest of it. Um, but also, I think it ties in a little bit to the challenges that we have, the questions that we put to you. Um, we see the need in the video, but we also see the importance of what we can do for ourselves. So, just wanted to check in on the results. So the importance of MHPSS in the first months of your COVID programming was a 3.6 out of 5. So fairly high, uh, but not at the at top, top level. Um, however, when it comes to mental health and well-being for yourself, you've scored it at a 4.2 out of 5. So, so quite high. Um, and I wonder if that COVID programming would actually be increasing over time as we see the implications um, of the lockdown, repeated lockdown, closes of school, economic, uh, and all the different factors that we know about. So thanks very much for giving us a bit of your perspective of um, how, you know, what you've been feeling individually and, and professionally. So using that kind of data, you um, develop some resources. Can you talk us through some of those? Yes, I'll turn over to Carmen for this part. Yes, thank you. Um, we're just going to go a little bit of an overview on, on what are the resources that, that we've been doing in response to these demands that Leslie was mentioning before. Um, and just to, to mention at the beginning that we've mostly worked in th with three partnerships, three very strong partnerships with the interagency, with the IASC, uh, also with the child protection area of responsibility, and of course with our host, uh, Save the Children, with, with whom we have a very uh, strong ongoing um, partnership. Um, so I'm going to present a couple of resources for each of these um, partners. So if we go to the next one, we will start with the work that we've been doing with the with IASC. This, of course, is very important because it's the coordination of all organizations working in humanitarian responses. So it allowed uh, for a lot of coming together with other great organizations. And also this one that I'm going to mention now and the next one, the two IASC resources, I would like to highlight that both were um, done in a way that first we listened from those who were going to use the resources from children in this case and the caregivers and for the next one that i'm going to present for responders so in both cases the the methodology was always to first ask to have very large surveys a very big trying to understand what people needed before developing resources and that's always a very good uh, approach um, and the first one that we want to present i really hope that many in this call already know it because it has become it has become a big thing, actually, is this book for children, My Hero Is You. It supports children in, in uh, uh, this beautiful story to understand about the virus, about their role in it, about how what can they do and how they actually are heroes in, in this response. Um, this book was an immediate um, success. It was really demanded. It has been translated to uh, in 123 languages and um, it has been adapted to many formats um, 
radio post podcast for those who can maybe read it or, or don't have access to the online link videos like the one that you have in the corner of the of the screen um, and also braille and and it's been adapted for children who might have visual impairments so um, it's really been a, a very big success just to mention before I continue that all over the, the PowerPoint slide that you are going to receive, um, you have all of the links. So every resource that I'm mentioning uh, in this presentation, you can all access them after uh, this session. Uh, the next one, it's um, the basic psychosocial skills, something that we, yes, sorry. Sorry, Carmen, just before you tell us about this one, um, in the chat box, we put a Mentimeter and we're gonna ask you, did you know this resource? There'll be a number of them. Uh, did you know this resource before the workshop? So if you could just at the same time as listening to Carmen and watching, also tell us on Mentimeter, were you aware of this resource? Back to you, Carmen. Brilliant. Good. Can I click yes in all of them? <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, Another one that um, we I'm really glad that we developed uh, because both, as we mentioned at the beginning, both Leslie and myself had worked very strongly in a PFA, psychological first aid, but there was a very strong call for what can responders do? How can first responders from law enforcement to medical professionals to pharmaceuticals, those who had to work throughout the, the, um, the pandemic, what can they do? to make sure that they contribute to the mental health and well-being of those they interact with. And, um, and PFA is a really good resource, but we had the opportunity here to expand and produce something that gives a, a little bit of a next level on what to do. And this is this guide. Uh, again, you have the link. Um, it has very practical advice on taking care of yourself and also uh, what to do if people are in distress, what to do in the practical uh, skills, um, communication, etc. This has already been translated to 21 languages and it keeps on being demanded at country level um, a lot. Uh, next one, please. Um, we move into what we have been doing with the um, Child Protection AOR. Uh, you just had a little bit of, a, uh, of an overview of the first resource, the well-being of you and your children. The video is actually a production that was made after the main document was produced and it's a very important guide um, to, to help caregivers, parents and other caregivers to um, support their own mental health and well-being and that of their children, especially in, taking into consideration the being at home, being in isolation or being quarantined and definitely the impact that that has on, on them and the children. Um, again, 14 languages already and, and adding on, <laughs> so that's also very used. Um, the next one that we did with the um, child protection area of responsibility in, in the next slide, it's a, a resource uh, on grief. Um, it's coming up. <laughs> um, this was also a big, strong request. It's not an easy topic. Um, obviously, uh, this pandemic has come with a lot of uh, losing people, sometimes not being able of seeing them, not being able of seeing by to grandma or granddad. Um, so we, we were requested to produce something that would answer some of these very important questions about children and grief. Do children grief? How do they grief? What can I do? Should I not talk about it? Or should I show that I'm very strong and I'm, I'm not affected? What do I do to make sure that I, I help my children in coping um, better with, with potential losses? Um, so that was also um, something that we developed with, with the area of responsibility. And then the final three resources that I'm going to mention, next slide, uh, are all developed together with Save the Children. Um, and um, the first one was developed very early in the, in the response, um, addressing the key issues for parents that had to uh, have the education transferred to the living rooms. And what do you do when your child is, uh, the, the school is closed and you have to cope with the uh, home schooling. And that's really connected. We know how mental health and well-being and education are connected and how important one for the other are. So this is a series of very um, specific, very useful tips on things like well-being and things that you can do for the child to feel better, how to uh, use setting goals or how to express your feelings and emotions. And it really contributes to caregivers managing that uh, situation at home um, with a lot of very practical um, knowledge. Something I would like to say about this one is a, a bit of a learning for us or relearning 
um, that we have to be very careful when we develop this, these resources to make them available for context where a, a reading material might not be accessible. So uh, we have uh, had a wonderful experience with these materials being disseminated over radio and even SMS in, in, in context where that was the, the best way of reaching children in their homes. And then the next one, uh, this, um, this resource that I just mentioned is the first one of a series of three. The second one is Keeping Connected. This is very practical and useful advice for teachers who uh, might be wanting to contact their children, the children that they teach, but in terms of mental health and well-being, how can a teacher reach out and check on their students? How are you doing? Detect if something is maybe not going well and provide support why the schools are closed. And the final one is uh, let's talk about it. And this is uh, very key for when schools reopen and children go back to school, make sure, making sure that we take time to first address how are we, how was it this period and how have you been and what is concerning you. And, and it has very uh, useful uh, sessions that teachers can use with the children when they go back to school to check on their well-being, first of all, as a great way of then initi initiating the classes um, as before. So these are the resources that we've been working on. I'm really intrigued to see how many of them our participants had, uh, had already heard about before. Uh, and I also want to just say very quickly that um, uh, our colleague Ashley Namiro has been amazing in developing most of all of these. And, um, and it's been also a pleasure to work with Leslie on the Ajax resources. It's like going back to how we met, <laughs> just to say that, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for bringing those resources. We can see lots of questions and really people thrilled that they're um, being exposed to these resources. We'll find out in a moment how many people knew them. Um, but first, we're going to put people into the breakout rooms because we're running a bit behind time. And we're going to ask you to do an exercise. So you're going to go randomly into 10 different groups. I think we'll still keep that number. There'll be, you know, four of you or so in a group. Um, and I would like you, you're going to have a jam board. So if you could put um, what your country was and what was uh, your adaptation challenge, what was difficult about your MHPSS programming that you needed to adapt for the emerging context. So if you could put that one, everyone does, does it individually, please. All right. And then on the second note, how did you resolve that challenge? If you could move the sticky on top of it, how did you resolve that challenge to the best of your ability so far? And then on the third sticky note, what resources are you still, um, so what resource did you use or do you wish that you had? So if you could either take two stickies for that and be clear, what is the one that you had and used and what is the one that you're still looking for in terms of a resource? All right, you have 10 minutes for that. Um, the breakup rooms are up and so you should be able to move to them. And Leslie, Carmen, and myself will move around. I think everyone's coming back. Super. All right. Well, sorry that the that breakout session was quite short, but hopefully it got you starting to share and, and to think about some of the challenges and, and opportunities there are for facing to those challenges. I know that in my group there was um, a question around staffing, around the number of people who are available to give um, support to children and families as well as taking care of them themselves. Um, we don't have time for a question and answer, but we have a, quite a few questions. So we'll see if we can get those to Leslie and Carmen and maybe get some answers to share with you in a different way. But I was gonna pass back to our two presenters about kind of how those resources were developed and, and next steps and plans. Sure, um, and, and I think uh, we'd really like to talk a bit about um, what we learned also through um, the resource development and, and, and so important. And um, I think, um, and I was just listening to a, a wonderful example from Sudan um, about, uh, yeah, we didn't get to finish, but it was, it was so interesting to hear about the real challenges um, in trying to manage this with vulnerable populations who also didn't have access to cell phones and really needing to go with loudspeakers and go to communities and starting with um, uh, telling people what is COVID because uh, not everybody understood or, or was um, uh, believed that it was a problem. So um, a lot of interesting work that was done. 
I would say one thing that we learned in developing the resources was the value of engaging families, children, and youth themselves in the design of them. Um, my hero is you is a good example. There are also adolescent resources that are coming out that have um, consulted adolescents directly. And I think that makes a big difference to how usable they are. Um, in the case of basic psychosocial skills that uh, Carmen and I worked on with WHO, um, there were a lot of uh, consultation processes around that too. So the voices of people with lived experience have been really important. Um, I think also in general, the, the COVID-19 response, you know, it triggered this big need and we responded with that, um, with all of these resources. So, but it also showed us that there's really significant investment that's still required um, for us to be able to deliver quality MHPSS programming. So I don't know what our Mentimeter showed, but I'm not sure everybody really had the resources. And then um, sort of the, the work that we need to do to really build capacity um, amongst child protection and education actors and health actors to be able to do that kind of multi-layered MHPSS support. Um, another important learning was just how do you make these accessible to a wide audience? So I think the, the animations and the audio podcasts in multiple languages that went out through radio, um, the, these large numbers of translations, um, my hero is you is one of the top translated books in the, in the world, apparently. Um, it's, that's what's needed in a global pandemic is that you really get things into the local language. Um, and so as Carmen already mentioned, the dissemination by radio and SMS was really important. And, um, my hero is you is also translated into Braille. So we need to think about people with disabilities and how we including that. And I think we've already mentioned um, that we need to be careful about being over-reliant on technology. Not everybody has this access, so we need to think about, and I think a lot of lessons from the field on this, so I just mentioned the loudspeakers, but how do we do this in the case of a pandemic when we also need to be sure that um, the staff are safe as they do that work? And I think Carmen, Leslie, I'm afraid, and Carmen, I'm afraid we have to wrap up. We have one minute. That was the bell, actually. We have one minute to wrap up. Carmen, would you like to say something as well? No, I think you've summarized very well all of the learnings. And uh, yeah, we, we're out of time. So great, great to yep. hear it. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> I didn't want to cut you off completely. No, no, I think it's, it's been a very good summary. I think we keep on learning. I think that's the conclusion. We keep on learning on how this is not going very soon. We're still working under the COVID situation. So even in our regular programming, we're learning how to do things online, how to reach, how to ensure that we listen to the voice of children. Somebody was mentioning on the chat, is it based on the needs expressed by children in a way that is safe and that is protective. So it's a daily learning on, on keep on developing and keep on working on these circumstances that are so extraordinary. And maybe well, just as a, a last thing, I would say just that, you know, we saw that there was a critical gap to fill with MHPSS programming. And so we, we you know, in a way, this is a, a good outcome of COVID is that that's more apparent to everyone. And, and hopefully we can have more resources and support that's going to be really useful to people in the field in the future. Yeah, that's great. Thank you both. Thank you for this presentation. Thank you for all the work, obviously, that's been going on with so many partners, as you've, as you've shown us, um, in order to bring us these resources and more to come. In the chat box, there is a link to the resources, and that will be where new resources will be, will be put up um, by the collaborative. Um, and I think you also have some connection, um, some contact details within Kiko Chat for those of you who want to reach out. So thank you again to Carmen and Leslie. Thank you everybody for your inputs uh, in the breakout rooms and a very lively chat box as well. Thank you. We'll see thank you all you. back in the plenary room. Thank you so much.